Section 1 of the Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 4, Lectures, Dresden Edition, published 1900. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Fry, Baton Rouge, Louisiana. The Works of Robert G. Ingersoll, Volume 4, Why I Am an Agnostic. Part 1. For the most part, we inherit our opinions. We are the heirs of habits and mental customs. Our beliefs, like the fashion of our garments, depend on where we were born. We are molded and fashioned by our surroundings. Environment is a sculptor, a painter. If we had been born in Constantinople, the most of us would have said, There is no God but Allah, and Mohammed is his prophet. If our parents had lived on the banks of the Ganges, we would have been worshippers of Shiva, longing for the heaven of Nirvana. As a rule, children love their parents, believe what they teach, and take great pride in saying that the religion of mother is good enough for them. Most people love peace. They do not like to differ with their neighbors. They like company. They are social. They enjoy traveling on the highway with the multitude. They hate to walk alone. The Scotch are Calvinists because their fathers were. The Irish are Catholics because their fathers were. The English are Episcopalians because their fathers were. And the Americans are divided in a hundred sects because their fathers were. This is the general rule to which there are many exceptions. Children sometimes are superior to their parents, modify their ideas, change their customs, and arrive at different conclusions. But this is generally so gradual that the departure is scarcely noticed, and those who change usually insist that they are still following the fathers. It is claimed by Christian historians that the religion of a nation was sometimes suddenly changed, and that millions of pagans were made into Christians by the command of a king. Philosophers do not agree with these historians. Names have been changed, altars have been overthrown, but opinions, customs, and beliefs remained the same. A pagan, beneath the drawn sword of a Christian, would probably change his religious views, and a Christian, with a scimitar above his head, might suddenly become a Mohammedan. But, as a matter of fact, both would remain exactly as they were before, except in speech. Belief is not subject to the will. Men think as they must. Children do not and cannot believe exactly as they were taught. They are not exactly like their parents. They differ in temperament, in experience, in capacity, in surroundings. And so there is a continual, though almost imperceptible, change. There is development, conscious and unconscious growth, and by comparing long periods of time, we find that the old has been almost abandoned, almost lost in the new. Men cannot remain stationary. The mind cannot be securely anchored. If we do not advance, we go backward. If we do not grow, we decay. If we do not develop, we shrink and shrivel. Like the most of you, I was raised among people who knew, who were certain they did not reason or investigate. They had no doubts. They knew that they had the truth. In their creed there was no guess. No, perhaps. They had a revelation from God. They knew the beginning of things. They knew that God commenced to create one Monday morning, 4,004 years before Christ. They knew that in the eternity, back of that morning, He had done nothing. They knew that it took him six days to make the earth, all plants, all animals, all life, and all the globes that wheel in space. They knew exactly what he did each day and when he rested. They knew the origin, the cause of evil, of all crime, of all disease and death. They not only knew the beginning, but they knew the end. They knew that life had one path and one road. They knew that the path, grass-grown and narrow, filled with thorns and nettles, 
infested with vipers, wet with tears, stained by bleeding feet, led to heaven. And that the road, broad and smooth, bordered with fruits and flowers, filled with laughter and song and all the happiness of human love, led straight to hell. They knew that God was doing his best to make you take the path, and that the devil used every art to keep you in the road. They knew that there was a perpetual battle waged between the great powers of good and evil for the possession of human souls. They knew that many centuries ago God had left his throne and had been born a babe into this poor world, that he had suffered death for the sake of man, for the sake of saving a few. They also knew that the human heart was utterly depraved, so that man by nature was in love with wrong and hated God with all his might. At the same time, they knew that God created man in his own image and was perfectly satisfied with his work. They also knew that he had been thwarted by the devil, who with wiles and lies had deceived the first of humankind. They knew that in consequence of that, God cursed the man and woman, the man with toil, the woman with slavery and pain, and both with death, and that he cursed the earth itself with briars and thorns, brambles and thistles. All these blessed things they knew. They knew, too, all that God had done to purify and elevate the race. They knew all about the flood, knew that God, with the exception of eight drowned all his children, the young and old, the bowed patriarch and the dimpled babe, the young man and the merry maiden, the loving mother and the laughing child, because his mercy endureth forever. They knew, too, that he drowned the beasts and birds, everything that walked or crawled or flew, because his loving kindness is over all his works. They knew that God, for the purpose of civilizing his children, had devoured some with earthquakes, destroyed some with storms of fire, killed some with his lightnings, millions with famine, with pestilence, and sacrificed countless thousands upon the fields of war. They knew that it was necessary to believe these things and to love God. They knew that there could be no salvation except by faith and through the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. All who doubted or denied would be lost. To live a moral and honest life, to keep your contracts, to take care of wife and child, to make a happy home, to be a good citizen, a patriot, a just and thoughtful man, was simply a respectable way of going to hell. God did not reward men for being honest, generous, and brave but for the act of faith. Without faith, all the so-called virtues were sins, and the men who practiced these virtues without faith deserved to suffer eternal pain. All of these comforting and reasonable things were taught by the ministers in their pulpits, by teachers in Sunday schools, and by parents at home. The children were victims. They were assaulted in the cradle, in their mother's arms. Then the schoolmaster carried on the war against their natural sense, and all the books they read were filled with the same impossible truths. The poor children were helpless. The atmosphere they breathed was filled with lies, lies that mingled with their blood. In those days, ministers depended on revivals to save souls and reform the world. In the winter, navigation having closed, Business was mostly suspended. There were no railways, and the only means of communication were wagons and boats. Generally, the roads were so bad that the wagons were laid up with the boats. There were no operas, no theaters, no amusement except parties and balls. The parties were regarded as worldly, and the balls as wicked. For real and virtuous enjoyment, the good people depended on revivals. The sermons were mostly about the pains and agonies of hell, the joys and ecstasies of heaven, salvation by faith, and the efficacy of the atonement. 
the little churches in which the services were held were generally small badly ventilated and exceedingly warm the emotional sermons the sad singing the hysterical amens the hope of heaven the fear of hell caused many to lose the little sense they had they became substantially insane in this condition they flocked to the mourner's bench asked for the prayers of the faithful had strange feelings prayed and wept and thought they had been born again then they would tell their experience how wicked they had been how evil had been their thoughts their desires and how good they had suddenly become they used to tell the story of an old woman who in telling her experience said before i was converted before i gave my heart to god i used to lie and steal but now thanks to the grace and blood of jesus christ i have quit them both in a great measure of course all the people were not exactly of one mind there were some scoffers and now and then some man had sense enough to laugh at the threats of priests and make a jest of hell some would tell of unbelievers who had lived and died in peace when i was a boy i heard them tell of an old farmer in vermont he was dying the minister was at his bedside asked him if he was a christian if he was prepared to die the old man answered that he had made no preparation that he was not a christian that he had never done anything but work the preacher said that he could give him no hope unless he had faith in christ and that if he had no faith his soul would certainly be lost the old man was not frightened he was perfectly calm in a weak and broken voice he said mr preacher i suppose you noticed my farm my wife and i came here more than fifty years ago we were just married it was a forest then and the land was covered with stones i cut down the trees burned the logs picked up the stones and laid the walls my wife spun and wove and worked every moment we raised and educated our children denied ourselves during all these years my wife never had a good dress or a decent bonnet i never had a good suit of clothes we lived on the plainest food our hands our bodies are deformed by toil we never had a vacation we loved each other and the children that is the only luxury we ever had now i am about to die and you ask me if i am prepared mr preacher i have no fear of the future no terror of any other world there may be such a place as hell but if there is you never can make me believe that it's any worse than old vermont so they told of a man who compared himself with his dog my dog he said just barks and plays has all he wants to eat he never works has no trouble about business in a little while he dies and that is all i work with all my strength i have no time to play i have trouble every day in a little while i will die and then i go to hell i wish that i had been a dog well while the cold weather lasted while the snows fell the revival went on but when the winter was over when the steamboat's whistle was heard when business started again most of the converts backslid and fell again into their old ways but the next winter they were on hand ready to be born again they formed a kind of stock company playing the same parts every winter and backsliding every spring the ministers who preached at these revivals were in earnest they were zealous and sincere they were not philosophers to them science was the name of a vague dread a dangerous enemy they did not know much but they believed a great deal to them hell was a burning reality they could see the smoke and flames the devil was no myth he was an actual person a rival of god an enemy of mankind they thought that the important business of this life was to save your soul that all should resist and scorn the pleasures of sense and keep their eyes steadily fixed on the golden gate of the new jerusalem they were unbalanced emotional hysterical bigoted hateful loving and insane 
they really believed the bible to be the actual word of god a book without mistake or contradiction they called its cruelties justice its absurdities mysteries its miracles facts and the idiotic passages were regarded as profoundly spiritual they dwelt on the pangs the regrets the infinite agonies of the lost and showed how easily they could be avoided and how cheaply heaven could be obtained they told their hearers to believe to have faith to give their hearts to god their sins to christ who would bear their burdens and make their souls as white as snow all this the ministers really believed they were absolutely certain in their minds the devil had tried in vain to sow the seeds of doubt i heard hundreds of these evangelical sermons heard hundreds of the most fearful and vivid descriptions of the tortures inflicted in hell of the horrible state of the lost i supposed that what i heard was true and yet i did not believe it i said it is and then i thought it cannot be these sermons made but faint impressions on my mind i was not convinced i had no desire to be converted did not want a new heart and had no wish to be born again but i heard one sermon that touched my heart that left its mark like a scar on my brain one sunday i went with my brother to hear a free will baptist preacher he was a large man dressed like a farmer but he was an orator he could paint a picture with words he took for his text the parable of the rich man and lazarus he described divvies the rich man his manner of life the excesses in which he indulged his extravagance his riotous nights his purple and fine linen his feasts his wines and his beautiful women then he described lazarus his poverty his rags and wretchedness his poor body eaten by disease the crusts and crumbs he devoured the dogs that pitied him he pictured his lonely life his friendless death then changing his tone of pity to one of triumph leaping from tears to the heights of exaltation from defeat to victory he described the glorious company of angels who with white and outspread wings carried the soul of the despised pauper to paradise to the bosom of abraham then changing his voice to one of scorn and loathing he told of the rich man's death he was in his palace on his costly couch the air heavy with perfume the room filled with servants and physicians his gold was worthless then he could not buy another breath he died and in hell he lifted up his eyes being in torment then assuming a dramatic attitude putting his right hand to his ear he whispered hark i hear the rich man's voice what does he say hark father abraham father abraham i pray thee send lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my parched tongue for i am tormented in this flame oh my hearers he has been making that request for more than eighteen hundred years and millions of ages hence that whale will cross the gulf that lies between the saved and lost and still will be heard the cry father abraham father abraham i pray thee send lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my parched tongue for i am tormented in this flame for the first time i understood the dogma of eternal pain appreciated the glad tidings of great joy for the first time my imagination grasped the height and depth of the christian horror then i said it is a lie and i hate your religion if it is true i hate your god from that day i have had no fear no doubt for me on that day the flames of hell were quenched from that day i have passionately hated every orthodox creed that sermon did some good from my childhood i had heard read and read the bible morning and evening the sacred volume was opened and prayers were said 
the bible was my first history the jews were the first people and the events narrated by moses and the other inspired writers and those predicted by prophets were the all-important things in other books were found the thoughts and dreams of men but in the bible were the sacred truths of god yet in spite of my surroundings of my education i had no love for god he was so saving of mercy so extravagant in murder so anxious to kill so ready to assassinate that i hated him with all my heart at his command babes were butchered women violated and the white hair of trembling age stained with blood this god visited the people with pestilence filled the houses and covered the streets with the dying and the dead saw babes starving on the empty breasts of pallid mothers heard the sobs saw the tears the sunken cheeks the sightless eyes the new-made graves and remained as pitiless as the pestilence this god withheld the rain caused the famine saw the fierce eyes of hunger the wasted forms the white lips saw mothers eating babes and remained ferocious as famine it seems to me impossible for a civilized man to love or worship or respect the god of the old testament a really civilized man a really civilized woman must hold such a god in abhorrence and contempt but in the old days the good people justified jehovah in his treatment of the heathen the wretches who were murdered were idolaters and therefore unfit to live according to the bible god had never revealed himself to these people and he knew that without a revelation they could not know that he was a true god whose fault was it then that they were heathen the christians said that god had the right to destroy them because he created them what did he create them for he knew when he made them that they would be food for the sword he knew that he would have the pleasure of seeing them murdered as a last answer as a final excuse the worshippers of jehovah said that all these horrible things happened under the old dispensation of unyielding law and absolute justice but that now under the new dispensation all had been changed the sword of justice had been sheathed and love enthroned in the old testament they said god is the judge but in the new christ is the merciful as a matter of fact the new testament is infinitely worse than the old in the old there is no threat of eternal pain jehovah had no eternal prison no everlasting fire his hatred ended at the grave his revenge was satisfied when his enemy was dead in the new testament death is not the end but the beginning of punishment that has no end in the new testament the malice of god is infinite and the hunger of his revenge eternal the orthodox god when clothed in human flesh told his disciples not to resist evil to love their enemies and when smitten on one cheek to turn the other and yet we are told that this same god with the same loving lips uttered these heartless these fiendish words depart ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels these are the words of eternal love no human being has imagination enough to conceive of this infinite horror all that the human race has suffered in war and want in pestilence and famine in fire and flood all the pangs and pains of every disease and every death all this is as nothing compared with the agonies to be endured by one lost soul this is the consolation of the christian religion this is the justice of god the mercy of christ this frightful dogma this infinite lie made me the implacable enemy of christianity the truth is that this belief in eternal pain has been the real persecutor it founded the inquisition forged the chains and furnished the faggots it has darkened the lives of many millions it made the cradle as terrible as the coffin it enslaved nations and shed the blood of countless thousands it sacrificed the wisest the bravest and the best it subverted the idea of justice drove mercy from the heart changed men to fiends and banished reason from the brain 
like a venomous serpent it crawls and coils and hisses in every orthodox creed it makes man an eternal victim and god an eternal fiend it is the one infinite horror every church in which it is taught is a public curse every preacher who teaches it is an enemy of mankind below this christian dogma savagery cannot go it is the infinite of malice hatred and revenge nothing could add to the horror of hell except the presence of its creator god while i have life as long as i draw breath i shall deny with all my strength and hate with every drop of my blood this infinite lie nothing gives me greater joy than to know that this belief in eternal pain is growing weaker every day that thousands of ministers are ashamed of it it gives me joy to know that christians are becoming merciful so merciful that the fires of hell are burning low flickering choked with ashes destined in a few years to die out forever for centuries christendom was a madhouse popes cardinals bishops priests monks and heretics were all insane only a few four or five in a century were sound in heart and brain only a few in spite of the roar and din in spite of the savage cries heard reason's voice only a few in the wild rage of ignorance fear and zeal preserved the perfect calm that wisdom gives we have advanced in a few years the christians will become let us hope humane and sensible enough to deny the dogma that fills the endless years with pain they ought to know now that this dogma is utterly inconsistent with the wisdom the justice the goodness of their god they ought to know that their belief in hell gives to the holy ghost the dove the beak of a vulture and fills the mouth of the lamb of god with the fangs of a viper in my youth i read religious books books about god about the atonement about salvation by faith and about the other worlds i became familiar with the commentators with adam clark who thought that the serpent seduced our mother eve and was in fact the father of cain he also believed that the animals while in the ark had their natures changed to that degree that they devoured straw together and enjoyed each other's society thus prefiguring the blessed millennium i read scott who was such a natural theologian that he really thought the story of phaeton of the wild steeds dashing across the sky corroborated the story of joshua having stopped the sun and moon so i read henry and mcknight and found that god so loved the world that he made up his mind to damn a large majority of the human race i read cruden who made the great concordance and made the miracles as small and probable as he could i remember that he explained the miracle of feeding the wandering jews with quails by saying that even at this day immense numbers of quails crossed the red sea and that sometimes when tired they settled on ships that sank beneath their weight the fact that the explanation was as hard to believe as the miracle made no difference to the devout cruden to while away the time i read calvin's institutes a book calculated to produce in any natural mind considerable respect for the devil i read paley's evidences and found that the evidence of ingenuity in producing the evil in contriving the hurtful was at least equal to the evidence tending to show the use of intelligence in the creation of what we call good you know the watch argument was paley's greatest effort a man finds a watch and it is so wonderful that he concludes that it must have had a maker he finds the maker and he is so much more wonderful than the watch that he says he must have had a maker then he finds god the maker of man and he is so much more wonderful than the man that he could not have had a maker this is what the lawyers call a departure in pleading according to paley there can be no design without a designer but there can be a designer without a design the wonder of the watch suggested the watchmaker and the wonder of the watchmaker suggested the creator and the wonder of the creator demonstrated that he was not created but was uncaused and eternal we had edwards on the will 
in which the reverend author shows that necessity has no effect on accountability and that when god creates a human being and at the same time determines and decrees exactly what that being shall do and be the human being is responsible and god in his justice and mercy has the right to torture the soul of that human being forever yet edwards said that he loved god the fact is that if you believe in an infinite god and also in eternal punishment then you must admit that edwards and calvin were absolutely right there is no escape from their conclusions if you admit their premises they were infinitely cruel their premises infinitely absurd their god infinitely fiendish and their logic perfect and yet i have kindness and candor enough to say that calvin and edwards were both insane we had plenty of theological literature there was jenkin on the atonement who demonstrated the wisdom of god in devising a way in which the sufferings of innocence could justify the guilty he tried to show that children could justly be punished for the sins of their ancestors and that men could if they had faith be justly credited with the virtues of others nothing could be more devout orthodox and idiotic but all of our theology was not in prose we had milton with his celestial militia with his great and blundering god his proud and cunning devil his wars between immortals and all the sublime absurdities that religion wrought within this blind man's brain the theology taught by milton was dear to the puritan heart it was accepted by new england and it poisoned the souls and ruined the lives of thousands the genius of shakespeare could not make the theology of milton poetic in the literature of the world there is nothing outside of the sacred books more perfectly absurd we had young's night thoughts and i supposed that the author was an exceedingly devout and loving follower of the lord yet young had a great desire to be a bishop and to accomplish that end he electioneered with the king's mistress in other words he was a fine old hypocrite in the night thoughts there is scarcely a genuinely honest natural line it is pretense from beginning to end he did not write what he felt but what he thought he ought to feel we had pollock's course of time with its worm that never dies its quenchless flames its endless pangs its leering devils and its gloating god this frightful poem should have been written in a madhouse in it you find all the cries and groans and shrieks of maniacs when they tear and rend each other's flesh it is as heartless as hideous as hellish as the thirty-second chapter of deuteronomy we all know the beautiful hymn commencing with the cheerful line hark from the tombs the doleful sound nothing could have been more appropriate for children it is well to put a coffin where it can be seen from the cradle when a mother nurses her child an open grave should be at her feet this would tend to make the babe serious reflective religious and miserable god hates laughter and despises mirth to feel free untrammeled irresponsible joyous to forget care and death to be flooded with sunshine without a fear of night to forget the past to have no thought of the future no dream of god or heaven or hell to be intoxicated with the present to be conscious only of the clasp and kiss of the one you love this is the sin against the holy ghost but we have cowper's poems cowper was sincere he was the opposite of young he had an observing eye a gentle heart and a sense of the artistic he sympathized with all who suffered with the imprisoned the enslaved the outcasts he loved the beautiful no wonder that the belief in eternal punishment made this loving soul insane no wonder that the tidings of great joy quenched hope's great star and left his broken heart in the darkness of despair we had many volumes of orthodox sermons filled with wrath at the terrors of the judgment to come sermons that had been delivered by savage saints we had the book of martyrs showing that christians had for many centuries imitated the god they worshipped 
we had the history of the waldenses of the reformation of the church we had pilgrim's progress baxter's call and butler's analogy to use a western phrase or saying i found that bishop butler dug up more snakes than he killed suggested more difficulties than he explained more doubts than he dispelled among such books my youth was passed all the seeds of christianity of superstition were sown in my mind and cultivated with great diligence and care all that time i knew nothing of any science nothing about the other side nothing of the objections that had been urged against the blessed scriptures or against the perfect congregational creed of course i had heard the ministers speak of blasphemers of infidel wretches of scoffers who laughed at holy things they did not answer their arguments but they tore their characters into shreds and demonstrated by the fury of assertion that they had done the devil's work and yet in spite of all i heard of all i read i could not quite believe my brain and heart said no for a time i left the dreams the insanities the illusions and delusions the nightmares of theology i studied astronomy just a little i examined maps of the heavens learned the names of some of the constellations of some of the stars found something of their size and the velocity with which they wheeled in their orbits obtained a faint conception of astronomical spaces found that some of the known stars were so far away in the depths of space that their light traveling at the rate of nearly two hundred thousand miles a second required many years to reach this little world found that compared with the great stars our earth was but a grain of sand an atom found that the old belief that all the hosts of heaven had been created for the benefit of man was infinitely absurd i compared what was really known about the stars with the account of creation as told in genesis i found that the writer of the inspired book had no knowledge of astronomy that he was as ignorant as a choctaw chief as an eskimo driver of dogs does any one imagine that the author of genesis knew anything about the sun its size that he was acquainted with sirius the north star with capella or that he knew anything of the clusters of stars so far away that their light now visiting our eyes has been traveling for two million years if he had known these facts would he have said that jehovah worked nearly six days to make this world and only a part of the afternoon of the fourth day to make the sun and moon and all the stars yet millions of people insist that the writer of genesis was inspired by the creator of all worlds now intelligent men who are not frightened whose brains have not been paralyzed by fear know that the sacred story of creation was written by an ignorant savage the story is inconsistent with all known facts and every star shining in the heavens testifies that its author was an uninspired barbarian i admit that this unknown writer was sincere that he wrote what he believed to be true that he did the best he could he did not claim to be inspired did not pretend that the story had been told to him by jehovah he simply stated the facts as he understood them after i had learned a little about the stars i concluded that this writer this inspired scribe had been misled by myth and legend and that he knew no more about creation than the average theologian of my day in other words that he knew absolutely nothing and here allow me to say that the ministers who are answering me are turning their guns in the wrong direction these reverend gentlemen should attack the astronomers they should malign and vilify kepler copernicus newton herschel and laplace these men were the real destroyers of the sacred story then after having disposed of them they could wage a war against the stars and against jehovah himself for having furnished evidence against the truthfulness of his book then i studied geology not much just a little just enough to find in a general way the principal facts that have been discovered and some of the conclusions that had been reached i learned something of the action of fire 
of water, of the formation of islands and continents, of the sedimentary and igneous rocks, of the coal measures, of the chalk cliffs, something about coral reefs, about the deposits made by rivers, the effect of volcanoes, of glaciers, and of the all-surrounding sea, just enough to know that the Laurentian rocks were millions of ages older than the grass beneath my feet, just enough to feel certain that this world has been pursuing its flight about the sun, wheeling in light and shade, for hundreds of millions of years, just enough to know that the inspired writer knew nothing of the history of the earth, nothing of the great forces of nature, of wind and wave and fire, forces that have destroyed and built, wrecked and wrought through all the countless years. And let me tell the ministers again that they should not waste their time in answering me. They should attack the geologists. They should deny the facts that have been discovered. They should launch their curses at the blaspheming seas and dash their heads against the infidel rock. Then I studied biology. Not much. Just enough to know something of animal forms. Enough to know that life existed when the Laurentian rocks were made. Just enough to know that implements of stone, implements that had been formed by human hands, had been found mingled with the bones of extinct animals. Bones that had been split with these implements, and that these animals had ceased to exist hundreds of thousands of years before the manufacture of Adam and Eve. Then I felt sure that the inspired record was false, that many millions of people had been deceived, and that all I had been taught about the origin of worlds and men was utterly untrue. I felt that I knew that the Old Testament was the work of ignorant men, that it was a mingling of truth and mistake, of wisdom and foolishness, of cruelty and kindness, of philosophy and absurdity, that it contained some elevated thoughts, some poetry, a good deal of the solemn and commonplace, some hysterical, some tender, some wicked prayers, some insane predictions, some delusions, and some chaotic dreams. Of course, the theologians fought the facts found by the geologists, the scientists, and sought to sustain the sacred scriptures. They mistook the bones of the mastodon for those of human beings, and by them proudly proved that there were giants in those days. They accounted for the fossils by saying that God had made them to try our faith, or that the devil had imitated the works of the Creator. They answered the geologists by saying that the days in Genesis were long periods of time, and that after all the flood might have been local. They told the astronomers that the sun and moon were not actually, but only apparently, stopped, and that the appearance was produced by the reflection and refraction of light. They excused the slavery and polygamy, the robbery and murder upheld in the Old Testament, by saying that the people were so degraded that Jehovah was compelled to pander to their ignorance and prejudice. In every way the clergy sought to evade the facts, to dodge the truth, to preserve the creed. At first they flatly denied the facts, then they belittled them, then they harmonized them, then they denied that they had denied them. Then they changed the meaning of the inspired book to fit the facts. At first they said that if the facts, as claimed, were true, the Bible was false and Christianity itself a superstition. Afterward they said the facts, as claimed, were true, and that they established beyond all doubt the inspiration of the Bible and the divine origin of orthodox religion. Anything they could not dodge, they swallowed, and anything they could not swallow, they dodged. I gave up the Old Testament on account of its mistakes, its absurdities, its ignorance, and its cruelty. I gave up the New because it vouched for the truth of the Old. I gave it up on account of its miracles, its contradictions, because Christ and his disciples believed in the existence of devils, talked and made bargains with them, expelled them from people and animals. This of itself is enough. We know, if we know anything, that devils do not exist, that Christ never cast them out, and that if he pretended to, he was either ignorant, dishonest, or insane. These stories about devils demonstrate the human, the ignorant, origin of the New Testament. I gave up the New Testament because it rewards credulity and curses brave and honest men, 
and because it teaches the infinite horror of eternal pain. End of Part 1 of Why I Am an Agnostic by Robert G. Ingersoll